We need help, so let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for your word. We need to hear from you, Lord. They don't need to hear from me. We need to hear from you. And so we pray, Father, that as your word is preached, that you would speak to us and help us to understand it by the power of your Holy Spirit and help us to apply it by the power of your Holy Spirit as we seek to glorify your Son. Father, we pray for this preacher, frail and insufficient as he is. We pray that you would help him to remember what you have taught him and to deliver this gospel to us. And help us to be good listeners of your word, to receive it with eagerness and to test everything. This is all for your glory. And thank you for making it for our good. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. One of the cool things to see is, is the kind of honor and respect uh, that people of the armed forces get in this country. And of course, we, our argument can always be made that, that more could be done and that, uh, that more is deserved. And yet, generally speaking, when, when a group of uniformed men and women come off of a commercial flight, there's often, they are often met with a response of applause. Strangers will go up to somebody in uniform and say, thank you for your service. Uh, there's magnetized ribbons in the back of cars that say, support our troops. We have holidays, one that, one that honors uh, our living veterans and another one that honors our fallen ones. And all of these things are, are good and right. And we do acknowledge on this day that, that freedom isn't free. The freedom that we have to gather here today in worship is, came at a cost. And we're grateful for even the veterans that served here in our own congregation. And one of them often reminds me that we don't have Fourth of July if not for the United States Marine Corps. And so we're grateful for those things. It does make one wonder why it is that the universal church does not show the same kind of honor, respect, support, and love for missionaries. It does beg that question, because are they not worthy of similar honor and support and love? In fact, can it be said that the rank of somebody makes the honor that is due to them commensurate with their rank. For example, does not a, a retiring colonel receive more laud and celebration than, say, someone who honorably served for a single tour? And so should not the soldier of God, the soldier of Jesus Christ on the front lines fighting spiritual warfare receive even more love and support and honor that is due to them? No offense is, is meant to the men and women who have served in the military when we say this, that as high a calling as it is to lay down your life to, to protect and defend the Constitution and the citizens of the United States of America, it is even a higher calling to lay down your life for Jesus Christ and his kingdom. So what we're not saying is we ought to respect and honor soldiers less. We're not saying that. Don't hear that. But what we are saying is we ought to honor, respect, and love, and support missionaries more, even more so. This sermon, though it started out talking about military, has nothing to do with soldiers fighting physical battles for an earthly nation and has everything to do with God's soldiers fighting real spiritual warfare and enemies on the field, breaking down strongholds of the devil. It has everything to do with that. What is our calling when it comes to missions? We often hear the phrase, we're not all called to go. And it's true. But we often breathe a sigh of relief with that. Oh. Because honestly, if we're being honest, not many of us have a desire to uproot our lives here in the states, in the comforts of a first world nation, and move our family over to a completely different culture, a completely different context, one that can often be hostile toward you, and you go there to share a gospel that many people hate and will potentially kill you for. Not many of us feel called to that. It takes a special grace for somebody to not only do that, but to actually love doing it. There's a, a man who was up at Grace Community Church in Minden, just a, actually, I think he's still up there, but 
A week or two ago, he gave a talk. He's a missionary to Papua New Guinea. He has been suffering from malaria for decades, like 20 plus years. And this last bout of malaria was so bad that it almost killed him and sent him back here on home assignment so that he can mend. But as he was talking, he sure didn't sound relieved to be here. He sounded in his words and in his voice desperate to go back out into the field, to get back into the fight. It takes a special grace for somebody like that. Now, let me just pause here real quick by, by way of segue that we say that many of us are not called to go, but maybe you are. There was a time probably in Scott and the shoemaker's life where they didn't realize that they were called to go be missionaries, but one day they did realize that. So don't discount the possibility that the Lord may be calling you to go to the nations. But again, for most of us, statistically speaking, we are not called to go. But we shouldn't breathe a sigh of relief for that. We should instead take a deep breath of focus for the fight that is ahead. Because even if we are not the tip of the spear going to Indonesia, make no mistake about it, we are in the fight. This great commission that that the Savior left to the church was not left for a select few. It was left to the church. We are all responsible to go make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that he's commanded us. Every single one of us not only can be part of that, you are a part of it. The question is, are you part of it well? Are you doing it well? So the aim of the sermon, the heart of this sermon, is to help you to do that well. And in particular, more specifically, that you would love missionaries. That you would grow in your love for missionaries. That's the aim of this sermon. Our passage is a part of 3 John. To call it an epistle... It's, it's kind of like a postcard, really. It's very short. It's in your Bible. It may just be one page like it is in my Bible. If you can't find 3 John, just, it's the third one from the back. So it goes Revelation, Jude, 3 John. If you got to 2 John, you went too far. 3 John is where we're at. 3 John was, is historically attributed to the Apostle John, uh, and it's written by the Apostle John to a guy named Gaius. This letter is in part a letter of recommendation from the Apostle John to this brother Gaius, recommending to Gaius Demetrius, a brother that's probably carrying this letter. Demetrius is probably carrying this letter from John to Gaius. So it's a letter of recommendation. Demetrius was probably a brother who was uh, leading out a group of brothers to go out and share the gospel, perhaps in Gaius's area or somewhere past Gaius's area. And so that's the context of our passage. Our passage is in specifically verses 1 through 8. And the main point of this passage, the main point of this sermon is this. It's a long statement, and then we'll break it down. It brings us great joy to see you follow Christ, specifically in your active love for missionaries here and abroad, because in doing so, you're part of Christ's mission. So if you miss some of those, don't worry. We're going to break those down one at a time. The first one, it brings us great joy to see you follow Christ. This will be in verses 1 through 4. So John begins this letter, this postcard to Gaius, the elder to the beloved Gaius whom I love in truth. That's interesting that, that just like in 2 John, John signs this letter as the elder. The word John is not anywhere in the text, so... How do we know that John wrote this book? Well, though church history is not the authoritative source of truth, only the Bible is, church history and tradition does tell us that the Apostle John wrote this letter, just as he wrote 2 John and 1 John and the Gospel of John and Revelation. And when you look at the grammar and the syntax and the word choices and the themes of love and peace, and it's clear that the same author wrote all of these letters that the author of 3 John is the disciple whom Jesus loved in the Gospel of John. So he calls himself an elder. Elders were and are the leaders of the church. Though I go by Pastor Ed and Pastor Rolo goes by Pastor Rolo, we are the elders of this church. In other words, we are overseers of this church. 
We are shepherds of this church. But in shorthand, we just go by pastor. But we are elders. And so did John call himself an elder. The apostles, though they had a specific calling and a, and a specific and higher authority as the foundation layers of the church of Christ, he still calls himself an elder. And it seems as if the apostles considered themselves elders, or at least Peter did as well. For example, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1, when Peter is exhorting the elders to whom he's writing, he calls himself a fellow elder. I exhort you, elders, as a fellow elder. And so we think that just in the same way that, that Peter considers himself a fellow elder, so does John the Apostle consider himself a fellow elder. And there's something very personal about this term. Rather than coming with the daunting authority of an apostle, he comes with the caring authority of an elder. So he signs the elder, and he says to who this is writing, to the beloved Gaius. We don't really know who this Gaius is. Gaius was one of the most common names in the Roman Empire. So we don't know who this specific Gaius is, and we don't know anything about him besides this letter. But one thing we do know is that he was dearly loved by the Apostle John. He calls him his beloved Gaius. And if that were not enough, he continues in verse 1, whom I love in truth. What does that phrase mean, whom I love in truth? Grammatically, what it could mean is something like, whom I truly love. I really love you. But that's probably not right. Consider, for example, the repetition of the word truth in verses 3 and 4. For I rejoice greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear my children are walking in the truth. And then in verse 8, Therefore we ought to support people like these, that we may be fellow workers for the truth. And so there's probably something more going on when John writes, Whom I love in truth, than just saying, I truly love him. So what is truth to John? Well, we consider the rest of his writings... This is going to be probably too fast for you to write down every reference. So if you want these references, come see me afterwards. But in his writings, John, uh, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and Revelation, here's what he says about truth. First, he quotes Jesus as saying these things. In John 4:23, that true worshipers will worship in truth. In John 8:32, that his disciples will know the truth, and the truth will set them free. In John 8, 44, that Satan does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. In John 14, 6, that Jesus himself is the truth. In John 14, 7, that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. In John 15, 26, that the spirit of truth would bear witness about Jesus. In John 16, 13, that the spirit of truth would guide them into all the truth. <clears throat> In John 17, 17, that God's word is truth. And Jesus asked that God would sanctify his disciples in it. In John 18, 37, that he came into the world to bear witness to the truth. And that everyone who is of the truth listens to his voice. And then John himself in his writings, he was quoting Jesus in all of those things. But John himself also says, John himself also says in John 1, 14, Jesus is full of truth. In John 1.17, truth came through Jesus. In 1 John 1.6, if we say we have fellowship with God while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. In 1 John 1.8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. In 1 John 2.4, whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. In 1 John 3.18, we are to love in truth. In 1 John 5.6, the Holy Spirit is truth. In 2 John 1, all who know the truth love the church in truth. In 2 John 2, the truth abides in us and will be with us forever. In 2 John 3, 
God's mercy will be with us in truth. In 2 John 4 and 3 John 3 and 4, our passage, we can walk in truth. And in 3 John 8, also in our passage, we can be fellow workers for the truth. So to misquote Pilate, what is truth? Truth, to John, seems to be an essence of who Christ is. Christ is truth. He is the truth. Jesus himself said that. The Holy Spirit, his spirit, is also the truth, the spirit of truth. Everything that he says is truth. Everything that he is is truth. Everything that he commands us to do is truth. And we, we labor in that because it's going to help us understand so many aspects of our passage. So when John says that he loves Gaius in truth, it's probably more than just saying, I truly love you. And it's probably more also than just a synonym for Christ to just say, I love you in Christ. But I love you in a way that encompasses everything that, he, that I just summarized from all of his writings. I love you in Christ. I love you in the spirit. I love you in everything that he taught. I love you in everything he is. I love you in the way that he commands us to. I love you in truth. And by the way, may we love each other in the same way. Then he goes on in verse 2, Beloved, there it is again, Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. This verse is, is a common greeting at the beginning of a letter in his time, but certainly it doesn't mean that he doesn't mean it for him. Out of love for Gaius, he really does hope and pray that everything would go well with Gaius, that he would be in good health as it goes well with your soul. And by the way, notice there that the health of the soul in this verse is supreme. It's almost assumed. Your soul is healthy. I hope your body is as healthy as your soul is. Spiritual health is far more important than physical health. But with that said, John is clearly not a Gnostic here. Gnostics believe that everything spiritual was good, everything material was bad, or at least irrelevant. That's not John. He does care about Gaius' physical health as well. And that encourages us also. May we love each other in a way that is holistic, that we care not only for the physical for each other, but also for the spiritual. And also not only the spiritual, but also the physical, that we would love and care for each other in that holistic type of way. All of that is leading up to the verses that really highlight our sermon point. Verse 3, he gives a, the reason for why he prays these things, the reason why his greeting is so warm. For I rejoiced greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. Notice those words, I rejoiced greatly. Why did he rejoice greatly? He rejoiced greatly because the brothers came and testified something to him. Who are these brothers? These brothers are probably Demetrius, the guy in verse 12, who we said earlier, probably is the one who carried this letter from John to him. So probably what happened was Demetrius and the, the evangelists heading towards John stopped at Gaius' home. And then from Gaius' home, they went to John. And then from John, they took a letter from John back to Gaius. You follow? So this is the brothers that testified something to John are probably Demetrius and that crew. Now, what was it that they testified to John about? They came, probably to John's church, and testified to your truth. They testified to John about Gaius' truth. There's that word again. And the definition of the way he's using that here is, is expanded on for us in the rest of verse 3. As indeed you are walking in the truth. In John's writings and others, when, when you have this picture of walking, the idea is your manner of life. So for example, in 1 John, John says that anyone who abides in Christ ought to walk in such a way that he walked. We should walk the way Jesus walked. We should live the way that Jesus lived. So that's the idea here. They testified 
to Gaius's truth, as indeed he was walking in the truth. He was living, again, in Christ. He was living according to the spirit of truth, who bore in them a lifestyle of truth, of obedience to what Christ, the truth, had taught and commanded them to do. And for John, he rejoiced greatly when he heard that. He loved to hear that about Gaius. And in fact, he even says in a superlative way in verse 4, I have no greater joy than to hear my children are walking in the truth. Now, when he says my children there, what he's, what he's referring to likely are those people whom he led to Christ or discipled unto Christ as the apostle, as the elder. Paul speaks about Timothy in 1 Timothy 1, 2 in a similar way. My true child in the faith. And so Paul to Timothy was like a father to Timothy in the spiritual way. Spiritual way. The same thing with John and Gaius and, and many others that he taught. He considered them his children. And so he has no greater joy, verse 4 says, than to hear that his children are walking in the truth. That's, that is massive. Likely he would say that his greatest joy is in Christ, but he says this in such a superlative way that other than knowing Christ, my greatest joy is to see my spiritual children walking and following Jesus Christ, walking in truth, being faithful to Jesus Christ. No greater joy. Why? Why is that such a big deal for him? Well, there could be a sense of kind of a fatherly, um, I'm proud of you. Picture, for example, a father who watches his son win a spelling bee, that, that feeling of delight of seeing that happen, or of a mother uh, seeing or hearing the first word of their baby and just happens to be mama, that feeling of, of delight, or, or parents watching their children walk across the stage for their high school graduation. There may be some element of that, but more likely the reason why it fills him with such joy to see his children walking in the truth is because he loves them. And for the human being, there is no greater satisfaction and joy than to be walking in obedience to God. And I say human being because it's, it's even true of unbelievers, even though they reject it, and they deny him. But when they are even accidentally following the law of God, they're just enjoying life more. But for the Christian, all the more, not only is it true that they benefit from following the law of God, but they love to do it because they're led by the Holy Spirit to not only do it, but to want to do it, to not only obey, but to desire to obey and when we are in obedience, when we are walking in the truth, there is no greater satisfaction for us. And so John, in his love for Gaius, in his love for his spiritual children, for him, there is no greater joy than to hear that his children are walking in the truth. There is some application to pastors here. There is no greater joy for us than to see you, our flock, walking in the truth. When I hear stories about you, like in D group, when we're summarizing our evangelism encounters, when I hear the courage that you guys have towards your coworkers to be willing to risk your job to share the gospel with somebody at work, ugh, it, it's such a delight. Or when we hear about you being willing to uproot your family and move to another country for the cause of Christ, or when you work out an interpersonal issue with each other instead of bringing other people or talking about each other to other people's backs, but instead you come together and you work it out even without our help, that's awesome. Or when you take a sin and you take it seriously and you make war with it and you tell us that you have some level of victory over it, that fills us with so much joy. And boy, we could go on and on. It fills us with so much joy to see you walking in the truth. And I'll speak for myself when I say that it's for reasons like what I just said and many, many others that I love pastoring you in particular. 
Some days are hard, I'll be honest. But I wouldn't trade you for any other church. I love you. You fill me with so much joy because I get to see your faithfulness on a daily basis. So while there is perhaps immediate application for the pastor here, we purposely left the sermon point vague when we say that it brings us great joy to see you follow Christ. Because while that's true, it should be true for the pastors who are shepherding their flock, and by the way, future pastors, I'm excited for you to experience that. There is also truth that that you, individual Christian, should also have no greater joy than to see your brothers and sisters in Christ walking in the truth. Because while it's true that pastors have responsibility for you, it's also true in another way that you have a responsibility for us and for each other. Hebrews 10 says, See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. And the author of Hebrews is not talking to pastors. He's talking to the whole church. So you have a responsibility for the advancement of, of every single Christian here, every single Christian that is a part of this church. You are to see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. And so it should grieve you when you see someone not walking in the truth. You shouldn't say, that's not my problem. Jesus says, yes, it is your problem. And it should grieve you to see someone not walking in the truth, and you should In accordance to Jesus' teachings, do what you can to help get that person out of their sin. And when they do repent, or when they are faithful, and when they are walking in the truth, it should fill you with so much joy. If you are apathetic about the spiritual state of your brothers and sisters in this church, then either you have a wrong idea about God, or you have a wrong idea about the church. Properly understanding the Word of God by the guidance of the Holy Spirit will lead you to rejoice when you see people walking in the truth. So is that you? I hope it is. So it brings us great joy to see you follow Christ. Specifically, number two, in your active love for missionaries. This is verse 5 and verse 6a. Even though what we just said of walking in the truth is really all-encompassing, John has something specific in view about what Gaius did in walking in the truth. And we see that in our verses 5 and 6a. Beloved, there's that word again. Beloved, it is a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are. Now, what was it? What, What was it that Gaius did for these brothers that that is included in all your efforts. Well, we don't really know the specifics, but what it seems like is that he showed them great hospitality. He loved them not just with word or not just with affection, but with action, which is why we're focusing in our sermon point on an active love. So what did hospitality look like in the Bible? The New Bible Dictionary helps lay that out for us, and And some of the things that this resource notes are these. That hospitality in the Old Testament was more than just a custom. It was also a demonstration of faithfulness to God. Failure to provide for the traveler's needs was a serious offense, liable to punishment by God and man. That a host was responsible for the safety and the welfare of his guests is vividly illustrated by Lot, and the old man of Gibeah. Bread and water was the minimum provision, though such meager fare was often exceeded. A guest's feet were washed from the dust of travel and his head sometimes anointed with oil. The best food might be presented and meat rarely eaten, especially procured. Curds and milk also particularly refreshed the traveler Animal fodder was supplied when required. And this was an interesting observation. Simon the Pharisee's home, Simon the Pharisee had Jesus over. Simon the Pharisee's home appears to have been an open house, judging by the way in which the presence of the woman who anointed Jesus was unconsciously accepted. And then finally, a special responsibility towards God's servants is also evident. And Jesus' earthly ministry 
and the apostles' missionary labors were greatly dependent on the hospitality that they received. So hospitality for us, when we hear that word, oftentimes for us, we just think about inviting someone over for dinner and being a good host. But as we see from these examples in the scriptures that hospitality is much richer than that. What we just read, that's just basic hospitality. That's just expected. So for these guys to be gushing over Gaius' love for them and telling John about it, and not just John, by the way, notice verse 6, who testified to your love before the church. So whatever Gaius did for them in hospitality above and beyond what we just talked about was enough for him, enough for them to testify not just to John, but to all of John's church, Gaius is amazing. He made us feel so loved when we were there. He is walking in the truth. So that is the scope. That is what the focus is of John to Gaius, that his walking in the truth, his following Christ, is evidenced by his active love for this group of missionaries. And that is the challenge for us as well, to have an active love for missionaries. Do we love our missionaries? Sure. We love Scott. We love the shoemakers. We love others. But what does that love actually look like in action? What does that look like for you? I'm not going to say that this church needs to love missionaries because that's going to let you off the hook. What does it look like for you to actively love the missionaries in our church? To do that is evidence that you are following Christ. To do that is evidence that you are walking in the truth. And so that is the big challenge for us, is to love them. Now, what does that look like? What does it look like to have hospitality, for example, to these missionaries? The application is going to be different because our missionaries already have a place to stay. Our missionaries, by God's grace, have enough financial support for now. The way that you can love them is just while they're here on home assignment. Hold on to that term. We'll explain it later. But while they're here on home assignment, lavish them with your love. Invite them over constantly. Be in their life. Let them be in your life. Equip them. Encourage them. Teach them what Christ has taught you. Use the spiritual gifts that the Spirit has doled out to you for their benefit. Speak truth to them. Call them out in their sin. Make them feel loved in such a way that wherever they go, they will testify to that church about your love. I'm not talking about First Baptist Church of the Lakes. I'm talking about you and you and you, that they would go to that church and say, that brother really blessed me. So what will you do? How will you love our missionaries well? And by the way, for many of you, you don't know. I'm talking about Scott and the Shoemakers a lot. You don't know who they are. Maybe it's because they were on the field when you got here. That's okay. They are strangers to you. So if you show love to them, it'll be like the way that Gaia showed love to these strangers. There is something even more amazing about Gaius' love because he doesn't know these guys, and you don't know them either. So for you to reach out to them and say, we need to have you over for dinner, over and over again. We need to have you, we need to include you in our D group because we love you. For you to do that as a stranger is an extra form, a higher form of love. But what that also implies is for we who do know them, it's kind of expected. We should be loving them already. We know them. They're not strangers to us. They're our brother and sister in Christ. It's easy to show hospitality to someone that you're already close with, and we ought to do that. So again, ask yourself, what are you going to do to actively love our missionaries? Think about that in D-group leaders and D-groups. Make sure that you ask about that. So it brings us Great joy to see you follow Christ, specifically in your active love for missionaries. And number three, here and abroad. Here and abroad. Notice in the end of verse six, you will do well to send them on our journey, on their journey, in a manner worthy of God. So what's interesting here is in his praise, in John's praise to Gaius of Gaius' love for these missionaries, he doesn't 
He doesn't take Gaius off the hook. He doesn't say, you have served them so well, you can hang up your cleats and go home. No, he says, do more. You have been so loving to them, do more. Send them out in a manner worthy of God. So again, what's probably happening is that they stopped at Gaius' house on the way to John. They touched base with John. John wrote a letter to him, and now they're back. And what he's asking them to do is not just take care of them again, but to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. This word that's translated send in Thayer's Greek lexicon, one of the definitions is basically to make sure that they have what they need for their journey, and that's almost certainly the idea here. It's not just send them, like give them a greeting card and a cake and a party, though that's not a bad thing to do, but there is more to it here. It's sending them so that they will have enough for the journey ahead, for the work ahead. So that's what we're talking about in our sermon point when we say here and abroad. We need to love our missionaries while they're here on home assignment and when they're out on the field. Just real quick, side note on home assignment. The shoemakers have learned in their training not to call this being home because that's tempting. (laughs) to give up on the mission. So when they're here, we use the phrase that they're on home assignment. They're here for a purpose, and their intention is to eventually go back out. I'm sure Scott agrees with that concept completely. This is not home. Don't make them feel like this is home. Do not tempt them to feel like this is home. Home is where God is sending them. That's where they're going to live. And for them to last 10 plus years, wherever they go is going to take the grace of God and our love and God's grace through our love. So Gaius was to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God. This phrase here, uh, manner worthy of God, it's basically talking about, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Something that is consistent with the object. So, for example, this phrase is used in in other places that let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel or worthy of the Lord or worthy of your calling. And so it is, whatever that you are doing, let it be consistent with this. And so what does it mean that he is to send them in a manner worthy of God? What it means is it can't be scraps. It can't be minimal effort. It can't be your loose change, Gaius. You need to give them your best as if you were serving God himself and you are serving God himself. Why? Verse 7. Here's the reason why Gaius is encouraged to send them out in the journey in a manner worthy of God. Verse 7. For they have gone out for the sake of the name accepting nothing from the Gentiles. So first, they've gone out for the sake of the name. What is the name? Well, the NET first edition Bible notes tells us that there are actually three suggestions for what the name is referring to. It could be referring to the Tetragrammaton or YHWH, God's name, which as it was being read was not pronounced. So oftentimes they would say instead Adonai for Lord which is why in your Old Testament, whenever the tetragrammaton of God's name, Y-H-W-H, it's often translated with the capital L-O-R-D, right? But also in rabbinical writings, sometimes that it would be replaced with the words, the name. So it's possible there that the name is referring to God's name. The second possibility is that the name is what the church went by before they were called Christians, at least the Johannine community, John's church, consider themselves the name. But the third possibility, which is most widely received, is that the name is referring to the name of Christ. In in, in 1 John, or uh, in John chapter 1, it talks about those who believe in his name, the name of Jesus. So whatever the case is, they have gone out for the sake of the mission of the church that God sent them on through Christ for his glory, for the glory of Christ's name. 
whatever it is, it is all true that these guys have gone out for the sake of the name. They've gone out for the sake of Christ. They've gone out for the sake of the mission. And because of that, Gaius was to send them in a manner worthy of God. The other reason was because they needed it. They needed help. The last part of verse 7, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Now, when John says Gentiles there, he's, there's no way he's talking about ethnicity here. He's not talking about he didn't accept anything from non-Jews. Because in Christ, there is no Jew or Gentile. In Christ, those who believe in Jesus, whether you are Jewish or not Jewish, you are one of God's people. So it's evidence to us that in John's church community, they had identified themselves, and rightly so, as the true Israel. All Jews and Gentiles who have believed in Jesus Christ are the true Israel. And in contrast, those who are Gentiles are unbelievers. So, in other words, they accepted nothing from unbelievers. For what reason? Probably, like Paul in 2 Corinthians, so that they wouldn't ever give the impression that they were out here for money, that they were out there peddling this gospel to get rich off of it. Now, Paul sometimes made tents, so this wasn't a universal rule. He made tents and sold them. But in this case, perhaps, they are doing it so that there is no mistake like, like the false teachers who are doing it for money, they are not doing it for money. So they accept nothing from unbelievers. They need help. And Gaius is called to love them and take care of them here and abroad. Now, we focused already on how to love them here. We've already talked a little bit about that. But how do we love them while they are abroad? Well, finances are a big thing in this situation. Because they may well be and probably will be in a context where they should accept nothing from the Gentiles. Or at least they shouldn't get rich off of it. So even if they start a business, they should not be getting rich off of this and living as these Americans that are on a high and mighty mansion in the middle of an island in Indonesia. That is not the way that the gospel is adorned well. So they need our help. They need our help. They should not be living off of them. They need our help to send them out. And so when you have the opportunity, bless them as lavishly and as consistently as you can. They will be setting up times and meetings to tell you about what they're going to be doing. And part of that will be support raising and fundraising in church. They need your help. They don't just need our help. They need your help. So consider how you will send them out in a manner worthy of God. And unlike Gaius, we have the, we have the benefit of uh, recurring payments. <laughs> we have the ability to have ACH payments. So you, you don't need to give up in your entire savings right now, but maybe you set every month something that automatically comes out. You don't even have to do it yourself. It automatically comes out. We also have the benefit of international mail. One of the things that, that we learned when we were visiting them in Tijuana is that we should not... Uh, minimize the impact of a care package. Now, what we're not talking about is sending them like candy that would make them want to come home. But give them resources. You find a book that's really helpful, send it to them. Ask them what else that they would want you to send to them. But it just reminds them that, that they are loved, that they are supported, and no, we don't want them to come home. We want them to stay there and fight. But we're going to give them what we can to lavish them not just here when they're on home assignment, but also when they are abroad. What will you do to be a part of that? So it brings us great joy to see you follow Christ, specifically in your active love for missionaries here and abroad. And finally, number four, because in doing so, you're a part of Christ's mission. In doing so, you are part of Christ's mission. Verse eight, therefore, we ought to support people like these, that we may be fellow workers for the truth. This is amazing, church. Don't miss this. This is incredible. If we support people like these, then we are fellow workers for the truth. What truth? Christ. We are fellow workers for his mission. We are fellow workers for what he has commissioned us to do. What he has commanded us to do, he allows us to take part of that. Isn't that amazing? 
It is not only a responsibility, it is a privilege to do this. No, it's a birthright. It's a birthright. In when we were joined to the body of Christ, we signed up for duty, but that duty is not a burden, it is a blessing. Why would it be exciting for you and for Gaius to be a part of Christ's mission? First, because he loves you and you love him. Well, provided that you're a Christian. Provided that you're a Christian. You may be here and none of this is interesting to you. You have no desire to take part in this mission that I'm talking about. And the reason why you're not excited about Christ's mission is because you are Christ's mission. He came to seek and to save the lost. And the reason why he calls you lost is because you have sinned against a holy and awesome God and creator. And because he is also a judge and you have sinned against him immeasurably, then your just judgment is eternal suffering, eternal wrath. But God gave his only son to die on the cross for sinners like you and me so that everyone who believes in him, rather than suffer that punishment we deserve, will have eternal life. There are those who go out for the sake of the name spreading that message. And if you believe in Jesus Christ, all of your sins are forgiven and you are saved for all eternity. And if all of your sins are forgiven and, all, and you are saved for all eternity, then you will be excited for Christ's mission to spread what happened to you all over the world, to take the delight that you have in worshiping God and spread that as far as you can, in any way that you can, to know Jesus and to make him known. If you love Jesus. If you love Jesus, you're going to want to be a part of this. This is incredible that he allows us to be a part of this. The other reason why we should be so excited to being a part of Christ's mission is that all of the hope that we have and express in the end of all things, and we do have that, the more that we suffer here, the more we say, come, Lord Jesus, please come, right? That won't happen until his mission is complete. This Lord that we say, come, Lord Jesus, to, is the same Lord who said that he will save from every tribe and every nation and every language. And there are 1,300 languages all over the world that do not have the gospel of Jesus Christ. Is that figure correct? 3,100. It's even, the stakes are higher. 3,100. Thank you, brother. 3,100 language groups that do not have the gospel of Jesus Christ. And our brother and sister in particular, are laboring to reach an unreached language group. And Scott may be laboring to, to go to a reached language group, but they need the gospel as well. But this end time hope that we have will come once the gospel has reached all the nations, as Jesus said in Matthew 24. This gospel reach every nation, and then the end will come. So being part of Christ's mission is a motivation for us to love missionaries in an active way while they're here and while they're abroad. So to sum up, it brings us great joy to see you follow Christ, specifically in your active love for missionaries here and abroad, because in doing so, you're a part of Christ's mission. So what can you do differently? What will you start doing today? Maybe, maybe you're not even 10 years old yet, but you love Jesus. Maybe he has saved you in your youth. Can, maybe you get an allowance. Maybe you take some of that allowance and you give it to the cause of missions. Listen, one dollar from an eight-year-old is going to make a missionary feel more loved than 50 times that from a grown-up, kids. Maybe you're a single young adult, but you're living at home. Maybe you ask your folks, folks, is it okay if I have these missionaries over for dinner? And when you have them over for dinner, roll it out. Love them lavishly. And it's going to depend on, on how the Lord has blessed you. Maybe that means that 
that you go for uh, Papa John's instead of Little Caesars. But you stretch. You, you give what you can so that they walk away feeling lavishly loved by you. Maybe you're a retiree and you have been blessed with financial wisdom throughout your whole life, so now you have just more money than you even know what to do with. It's just sitting there in savings where moth and rust destroy. Maybe you consider right now, what is it that I can do to send out these missionaries on their journey in a manner worthy of God? Listen, I'm not saying that we can be a part of this. I'm saying that we are a part of this. You are a part of this. The question is, will you do it well? Will you do it in a manner worthy of God? What will you do? Let's pray.